Um, welcome, everyone. This is the uh, Profitable Regeneration webinar series, and it's also being repurposed as the um, Profitable Steward podcast. We're, we're grateful to have many of you here live today. Um, we do these things live on the second Thursday and fourth Thursday of each month. And we're going to try to keep that cadence up throughout this coming year. Um, we've had some some good things, good results from this. Um, we are just uh, on the backside of a pretty awesome summit. And we had some amazing speakers last week on our virtual summit. Um, if you haven't been able to check that out, I'll, I'll drop a link um, here for those that are live and in the show notes on the podcast. And also want to make you aware that that is um, available for free to be able to go back and rewatch. Uh, it's on a it's on our YouTube channel. Um, we are going to be pulling that offer down uh, probably tomorrow, and you'll have lifetime access. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to be able to get that and and also register for an upcoming class that we have with Ag Steward. So we're grateful to have Dan Leahy with us here today. Dan is um zooming in from Arizona. He is a uh, kind of a traveler nowadays, right? Dan, you, you give to see a lot of, a lot of country. Uh, sure. Um, so been on the road for, um, almost two years now, um, graduated the last of five boys a couple of years ago. And, uh, so it was time we hit the road and spend about roughly, uh, one quarter of each year, uh, on a, host property with a client. Um, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's a little more, but um, that gives us a chance to really uh, get to know the client operations and contribute on a daily basis. So, uh, so far it works really well for us. Um, we're enjoying it and uh, hear good things from our clients. So that's kind of our, our schedule right now. And um don't have any immediate uh, plans to change. Um, some of those client situations are developing, so you just never know. Some 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 of them might turn into more permanent uh, roles in the future. Well, good. Yeah, you had the opportunity to visit William and I last year, and we sure appreciated your visit. Appreciate your vast experience and um, and knowledge from managing and uh, consulting on ranches throughout the United States. Um, and so as we as we kind of kick off here today, that's going to be the focus of what we're going to talk about here is about ranch management. And maybe you can talk a little bit about what what you do in your consultancy practice, as well as um, kind of your ranch manager program. And uh, yeah, so just just kind of take it away and run with it. And then those of you that are here live, feel free to type in questions if you need questions and clarification and I'll kind of facilitate that. And then at the end, we can open it up for a little more informal discussion. Sure. So the way I got started in this particular thing was not necessarily by accident, but I think it was serendipitous because um, having come off the, uh, about six years of managing two different ranches, um, I realized I spent a lot of time an inordinate amount of time uh, identifying and recruiting employees. And specifically, the, the top job on those ranches, um, because I was occupying the position, I, um, I, I undoubtedly had, you know, an extra burden when it came to replacing myself and leaving that person in charge. And so it just very naturally uh, piqued my interest. And so a lot of windshield time thinking about it. And I thought, you know, uh, you know what could go wrong? I, I'm just going to study this. And, and, and so we started the Foundation for Ranch Management as a vehicle for this work, for this study, because I just was fascinated about how um, diluted our industry is naturally. Um, of course, technology has made you know, all the difference in the world in the last three or four years, but um, it's the nature of the industry. We all work in remote places. Uh, we have our, lo our local um, uh, networks that we rely upon and contribute to, but even still, um, when it comes to hiring, <clears throat> it's kind of a catch-as-catch-can thing. 
um, I would say, and these are just my own personal observations. They're not scientific in this regard, but I would say uh, maybe up to half of hires are direct referrals, seems to me. Um, so somebody knows somebody who knows somebody. Um, and then you have your your whole collection of online job boards that that sometimes work and sometimes don't. Um, most of the people listening are already familiar with them. Um, I will say that uh, those of you who know Jesse Jarvis up in Idaho and her uh, website of the West, I think is one of, of an excellent example of one of a new effort um, to add, you know, super valuable content uh, all the while posting job ads. And she doesn't, focus in any one area in the uh, Western uh, landscape, um, but, uh, but opens the door to everybody. And um, can you, can you repeat that website real quick, Dan? And that's one I'm not the name in the website. I'm not familiar with. Right. It's spelled of the West dot C O. And the M is not missing. It's, it's just a new, mm -hmm. uh, new space dot C O. Okay. And then there was another quick question just to clarify. What do you mean by the industries being diluted? No, I, I guess what I meant to say was it seems diluted when you look at it on the face of it because everybody's so spread out. Okay. Everybody's spread out geographically. Everybody is beyond busy, you know, so on and so forth. And so um, it, takes, it takes some work. And thank goodness we have technology because that's helping us everybody keep up and stay connected. Perfect. You just imagine what it was like when we had to go look for a telephone, right? We've all, all forgotten those days. So um, getting back quickly to finish my story, um, uh, we started the foundation, did a couple quick, pro quick projects, and um, all of my work is uh, by referral. I, I don't advertise. I don't even have a website. Um, and I'm not sure that I would have time for it if I did. So that... That is working out just fine. Um, uh, just a, kind of a, a funny aside, um, when we were making arrangements to speak at uh, CattleCon in Orlando, um, <laughs> the woman in charge of, of um, booking us there wanted to know if it was going to be a problem if, if we were uh, presenting al along with uh, another ranch consulting company. And um, I had to kind of chuckle because... There is no shortage of work in our business at all. <clears throat> um, it, it seems unlimited. So, you know, the more people who uh, can share their expertise, they're going to find an audience for it. And I would encourage anybody who feels like, you know, I've invested a lot in this. I feel, I feel like I've learned a couple of things. And you can find a venue. By all means, you should share it because... Um, we always think that our situation is different and nobody's interested in our little situation, but it's just not the case. Everybody's doing something interesting. So that's, that would be my, my two cents on that. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, well, good, good to get some context. And so, um, with those that you consult with, would you say that, that, largely they're committed to regenerative practices or are they more um, traditional? Where, where do you put yourself kind of on that continuum of, you know, I guess, uh, regen ag versus just uh, profitable ag? Sure. And, and of course that is where I always start is on the profitable side. And um, when we get to some of the, the tools that we use in the foundation, I can speak more to that, but um you know, I, and I, and this is not a slight at all, uh, but, you know, whether it's the word regenerative or organic or sustainable, you know, those words, those adjectives just get beaten around. And, and then one day that, that adjective is gone and has been replaced by a new one because too many people have co-opted it. And now it's time for, you know, to recast the message. But I think regenerative uh, will have more staying power. Um, I think it will become known 
more deeply. And I think it's because it's, it is tied to the soil. And, and so if we just say soil, then we don't have to worry about buzzwords anymore. We're back to basics. And, um, you know, it used to be grass, right? Grass was the bottom line. And thankfully, you know, we've, we've come to realize that, um, we wouldn't have grass without soil, soil, and we wouldn't have anything healthy without healthy soil. Right, William? <laughs> Amen. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. So um, I bring up William's name. I'm glad to see see who's on here. Is when uh, when we visited you about a year ago, I had a chance to sit in the greenhouse and visit for an uh, hour or more, and. Then I had a chance to bring William to a ranch in Wyoming. And, um, and so we've started that process on that ranch. Um, they have no soil. They have some bottom land, but it's, they have granite sand and that's it. So, you know, it's a very challenging uh, situation for them there. <clears throat> they get exactly the amount of grass uh, relative to the amount of nitrogen they put on the, on the ground. And so, we're starting with the meadows and working our way up into the pivots and anxious to see what William can help us accomplish up there. Yeah, I appreciate that. What, um, I mean, hopefully this isn't a tangent, maybe one more question and we'll just kind of let you run with your presentation and what you have, but, um, I'm always interested to, to ask definitions of words and how would you re define regenerative? Uh, define it or redefine it? Um, define it from your from your perspective or your own definition of what does regenerative actually mean? Not the, not the buzzword, not the label, you know, in its pure form, I guess. Yeah. Well, we we should understand what the cycle of life looks like, and so you know, with that basic knowledge, um, and. And honestly, you know, a lot of people never get the requisite amount of chemistry. They never get the requisite amount of hydrology uh, and the things they need. And they tend to figure it out as they go or they learn on the job. Um, but I think once that we we do have a complete picture of what the natural cycle is, then it's incumbent upon us to make sure that none of those components are compromised. And in my estimate, in my view, that's the basics right there. Um, you know, we can go back to this whole uh, use of nitrogen. That could be an example of it. You know, if you if you are dependent upon nitrogen uh, supplements and you have no intention of ever changing, um, you know, I would I would say that's that's maybe a functional way to proceed. But I don't know that it's regenerative because you're just ignoring components that that have been um, factored out of the nature cycle. So maybe that's overly simplistic, but it works for me. That's good. I appreciate like that. Like you said earlier, I tend to go very quickly to the profit issue, you know, after that. Yeah. Um, and I, I appreciate that. That was one of the focuses of the first summit that we did in 2023 and definitely an underlying uh, foundation for this last one that we did. And we do call this the Profitable Regeneration Webinar Series for a reason, because um, we can't be regenerative if we're not profitable, like was um, at least not at scale. Right. Like we it, it's one thing to regenerate your lawn or your garden. Um, and and by all means, we should do that. Um, but to actually reach a tipping point whereby we are not in a soil loss situation, um, like we are in most of the um, industrialized countries in the world, we have to begin to adopt some of these regenerative practices that and and the principles that underlie them. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about um, or what what direction would you like to go from here? I guess. You want to talk? I really, I, you know your audience better uh, than I I do, Jared. I I would just. I'm just happy responding to any cues that you might, might come to mind. Yeah. Well, um, so yes. And those that are live here, please feel free to continue to ask questions. We'll interject those. 
But um, another question that I like to ask, and I've asked this of Alan Williams and others that have been on this podcast, what what are the principles that you see that are common amongst businesses that are proper, profitable and regenerative and have a team in place that likes to be there? There's the good work culture as well, right? Because I think all of those things are essential. Um, if you hate your job and you're not doing, you're not living your passion, you can be profitable and regenerative, but it's, it's, that's not sustainable either. So um, are there some key things that you focus in on or help your clients to achieve to be able to um, or obtain all of those and some commonalities amongst those ranchers that have reached that? Sure. Well, one of the first things I do out of necessity would, um, when I arrive on a property is I do a, um, an enterprise assessment. So, um, again, that's from my own knowledge. I need to understand the operation as quickly as possible, but in most cases, the owner hasn't done, or the manager, either one ha has not really done, uh, a true, uh, enterprise assessment. And one of the things that, that I try to stress with people is that we tend to think of enterprises as things that make us money. But in, if you look at it on its face, an enterprise is anything that requires inputs and has an, some kind of expectation and outcome. So, you know, to be real, to real, real simplistic, you, some of these ranches spend a lot of money on road maintenance, right? They don't make any money. It helps them get around the ranch. It helps them get to market, whatever. There's Maybe there's a safety factor involved as well. But the fact of the matter is, it's an enterprise. And so you need to put that down regardless. And then once you have those all those enterprises um, uh, down, you can look at them. Then you can start making trade-offs because at the end of the day, every, everything's a trade-off. Uh, but if you don't see it as part of your total commitment, you're not in a position to make those trade-offs um, and assign value to those things accordingly. So that's in terms of uh, work, working with clients, that's where we almost always start. Um, because again, if you don't know where your money's going, where your energies are going, uh, you, you can't make value decisions. And, and that is the first essential for progress. I think everybody has seen the value uh, triangle. Um, if you imagine a triangle or you've got time on one axis and you've got cost on another, and then you've got quality on the third. The way, the way this theory goes is you can have two of those things, but you can rarely have all three. So that's the economic conditions that we live in on this earth. We live in under limits. And if we didn't, we wouldn't have value. So if you want something fast and cheap, quality is going to suffer. If you want it quality and, and, and um, inexpensively, it's going to take a long time. So it's another way I, you know, I try to explain to my clients the decision-making process and get them prepared for that. Yeah. So as you, as you look at those enterprises, um, I know one of the ranching for profit principles is that um, many of the top performing businesses in ranching actually do less. Is that a common that you see as well? Like some of those things can be stopped without directly affecting the, um, the gross income and net income. Like, may, I guess, can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. And, and to your point about scale, you know, scale is uh, all about faith. It's about study and judgment. But once you've done your study and made your judgments, it's a huge um, step of faith because you can't be, there's no middle ground there. If you're going to scale and that's your business model, then you have to leave your safety net behind and trust your model. Okay. Okay. A uh, couple things come to mind. Um, you know, one of the things I learned from you, Jared, uh, when I was at your place last year, is I think you said you only had like 28 head of cattle. 
or 32 head of cattle. And <clears throat> while, while I was only mildly surprised, I immediately realized what was happening. You're, you're focused on throughput and you're retailing your beef. So you're not going to carry any more head than you can retail, right? So you understood your scale, even though it was a small number of, of cattle. Is that reasonably accurate? Right. And that's, that's cattle that we owned. Um, just before Christmas, we had about 2,400 head of cattle on the ranch. Right. Um, but they were not, a, they, they were under management, but not ownership. Right. Right. And so, um, you know, when, when you, you want, you look at your carrying capacity first, and then all those other things that, that cost you money to see where your profit, your break even point is, but you're right. Um, I will often say, look, you should not be doing your own farming. Okay. Your neighbor already owns this equipment. It's going to cost you half to have him come in here and farm this field for you. than it is for you to keep the lease on this tractor. That, those types of trade-offs are every single day. Um, and that, that goes to another part of our conversation where of communication on the ranch. You can't have those communi- You can't get commitment from your people unless they're part of those decisions, because if they don't understand the reasoning behind those trade-offs, you don't have their heart, soul, and mind on the ranch. So I, I have a lot of clients who call me, you know, the counselor, the, and, and they're talking about marriage counseling, or they're talking about parent and child counseling. And I don't, none of us ever set out to do that, but it's unavoidable. So when you start making those trade-off decisions, um, you know, it's very important that everybody agrees to it, at least try it. Um, and then as you move forward, you don't have to worry so much about the communication breaking down amongst the team members. So, you know, whether it's farming out the road work, it's farming out the, the, the field farming itself, um, having more than one conversation right now with um, local co-ops, uh, co-ops between ranchers who are wrestling with the idea of whether they should bring in their own butcher and, and start their own processing plant. It's almost endless. But it, it's always driven by local circumstances and no two ranches are the same. So that's why there's so much work involved in this assessment process. Yeah. So when you start that assessment process, you look at enterprises, um, any deadwood that needs to be cut out, enterprises that might need to be cut out or ones that can be scaled. What are what are kind of the next things that you look at when you step foot on the ranch and meet the meet the family or the um, team that you're consulting for? Well, one of the things that I'm concerned about before they are is try to get an idea of the longevity. Um, you know, how much track do they have in front of them, regardless of what they've come through? Because that's going to dictate the investment in the ranch, um, not, in ter- not only in terms of dollars, um, equipment, herd size, and that type of thing. But how much time and effort are you going to put into your people? Um, this is one of the things that you know, I'm going to be talking about in Orlando. The, the theme for NCBA this year is rebuilding the herd. And, you know, that's an interesting phrase because you, you can kind of take that in a number of different ways. You can talk about the cattle themselves. And I'm going to talk about rebuilding, you know, the seed stock in our, in our young managers. Um, ranches are changing hands at a faster rate than any time in history at higher prices than any, that at any time in history. And add to that, um, the majority of new owners are going to be investors, not ranchers. They may or may not become ranchers in this process, but there's going to be all kinds of different scenarios played out over the next 10 years. Uh, because you have owners uh, who have all these different um, motivations. Somebody said to me once, um, or I overheard the question, why would uh, an investor buyer 
choose to run cattle on the ranch that, that he purchased when he's otherwise been very successful at other things. And now he's looking at a business with less than 10% returns and a whole lot of risk. How could that possibly be attractive to that guy, that person? And I, what I would say by having worked with those people is that many of them understand the need for quality protein, period. And that's why they're doing it. So, you know, that's my first caution is don't look at with a jaundiced eye at these moneyed individuals who are buying generational ranches. Take each individual on their own merits and work with them. Because if you don't, you're going to end up with neighbors that you have no relationship with. Yeah, interesting. Um, so kind of on this, um, what's your, on your assessment, there's a, there's a question that might fit in here. Is there a sweet spot of cows to employee ratio? Well, I want to believe it's Burke Tykert's. I, that's what I want to believe one to one to 500 head, but circumstances, you know, impinge upon that sometimes. You know, you're 7,500 feet in, in Wyoming. Uh, that, that doesn't work. It's just, it's just too much work on the ground. There's too much pushing in the summer. There's too much, uh, you know, really arduous calving in the winter. Um, so that's a scenario that it, it doesn't work. And then again, it depends on how your ranch is set up. If you've got good fences and the gates are in the right places and you have contiguous pastures, you know, those types of things, maybe it will work out. How tame are your cattle? You know, all of that. Yeah. Figures in. Yeah. Another, you know, as another uh, rule of thumb is gross profit per employee is another way to be able to measure that. And, and so that might equalize things a little bit. Whereas some of us um, maybe who are direct marketing have less head, but there's mm -hmm. more work. And so that would skew the, the head per employee ratio. Um, right. So we tend to look more at that at kind of the gross profit um, side of it. But um, with, when you traveled the country and uh, every part of the country is unique, has its advantages and challenges is there one part of the country that you feel like, man, this is just God's country and the best place to ranch? And again, that that could be cow calf. We'll say we'll say to run a cow calf ranch. Yeah. If you could just say, man, I just this is the place that I would want to live, or for whatever reason, this is why this is, in your opinion, the place. Sure. And I, I real quickly, I'd like to comment on your first the first part of your sentence, and then I'll get to your answer, but. Um, the, well, that is an aside. So I'm going to stick to your answer. Um, I, I focus on the cow calf operation in the West, typically a smaller base, base ranch with public grazing, because it's a scenario that I think in, it's the most challenging scenario to work with. I think it has the most variables. And, you know, other people, you know, could disagree with me because they've had a different experience, but it just is different. You know, it's different than having, you know, several thousand acres of Nebraska corn stalks um, or several thousand acres of Oklahoma grass. Uh, it's certainly different than Texas. I don't know what they eat down there, um, but they make do, you know, it, they find the right animals and, and, they, and they make it happen. Um, so the, the base ranch, uh, in the cow calf operation, I think has my attention just because it has so many different challenges to it. It's, it's, and so you, you have, to, you have to make it all work. And, uh, that's what I, that we're drawn to, you know, our circuits, basically Nevada, Oregon, Idaho, and Wyoming. So a lot of desert, but also a lot of altitude too. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, I've definitely looked and I know, um, ranchers who trade ranches. Are you still there, Dan? Yes. There we are. Okay. Sorry. My 
deal just switched you in play in order of uh, videos here. So, um, yeah, I have friends that uh, buy and sell ranches and we're definitely partial here to the West, but I think a lot of that is because this is where we raised and this is our context of what we understand. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so another question here from William. Um, do you think there are land managers who understand basic ecology enough to appeal to appeal to new landowners who are quote environmental extremists? Oh, good one. So <clears throat> I would say the only rule that I really have uh, in, in terms of clients, and I, I do have the opportunity to pick and choose sometimes, but I can't work with a client, regardless of our differences, because we're going to have differences, but I can't work with the client where their first consideration is not the land. It, that is the basis for it. And we, we, what conversations would we have if we couldn't start there? Um, they wouldn't be very substantive. And I've worked on recreational ranches and left them because there wasn't enough emphasis. Um, you know, big ranch in California that was largely under CRP. And for the owner, that was just fine. He thought it was, he was able to park park his responsibilities in crp and it that was six thousand acres of star thistle and i couldn't take it anymore so i you know if that if that's kind of what you're asking about um, those owners are out there but also your broker friends can probably tell you that the turnover with investors is you know three to ten years that's the majority of it. I mean, we'll, we'll see moving forward if that if that changes, but they do turn those ranches pretty predictably. Yeah, that's um, that's that's interesting. So when you when you find somebody whose primary focus isn't the land, would you say it's just more on um, the dollars they can get from the land, or is it uh, is it just owning it for recreation or whatever else and it can be a whole, you know, combination of things is personality driven. Um, but I look, like I said, I look for beyond personality. I look for fundamentals. And if they're telling me that the land is that important, you know, then we can work on that. We can work on that for a long time without agreeing on anything else. There's only 24 hours in a day. And so I, I look at it that way. I'm going to focus on what I can make progress on and what I think is in the best interest of the property. Yeah. And you know, you often have very different views on politics and society and those types of things. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and to kind of answer Aliyah's questions uh, uh, here, what do cows eat here in Phoenix or in the desert areas? I mean, you definitely have to have a cow that's adapted to that place because you you take a cow from Nebraska and dump them out on the Nevada desert, and they probably will starve to death. And you know what? Right. And even a cow going from here to Nebraska, it's going to take some acclimation. But um, along with that, how important from your standpoint as a manager is having an adapted cow to the ranch as or as a as a consultant or in a management position? Yeah, well, so what I see is two, two, two things. I, first thing I see is tradition. OK, so. My dad ran Herefords, my granddad ran Herefords, his dad ran Herefords. So they're Hereford people. And so that's one end of the spectrum. And then the other end of the spectrum is, um, and Wyoming's another, again, a good example of this. You know, they have, they're dealing with brisket and other complex situations that they don't have a choice. They have to keep an eye on these selections every season because their circumstances are changing and it can go sideways really fast. So, so they're thinking about it all the time. Um, and they're trying to optimize those breeds for their circumstances and get an advantage at the same time. Yeah. And, uh, that was a big topic from what we talked about last week on the summit when Steve Campbell talked about the profitable cow having a cow that is acclimated to our environment, the right genotype, the right phenotype. And 
I know Bert Tigert's talked a lot about that and mm -hmm. um, kind of dispelled the myth that, you know, you can't afford to raise heifers. In some areas, you, you really probably can't afford not to, especially whether there's a pineal abortion and things like that, where it's important that they um, are trained and and uh, the epigenetics are more critical in those situations. So I'll see if I can give justice here to Jessica's question. Um, she's asking what's more common uh generational ranchers that lack understanding of regenerative grazing practices and principles or brand new ranch owners who are not yet aware of regenerative practices sure um it would be a it'd be a cop out if i said they're equal but there's examples on both sides so you know, the average ranch owner, uh, generational ranch owner is quickly approaching 70 years of age. They're not going to change. So if they if they were fortunate enough to understand their property uh, as it was given to them and succeed with it, um, they're probably doing something right. Right. I'll call it maybe call it an 80s percent solution, but they're maybe but they're maintaining and they're not making any ground. You know, William would look at their soil samples and say, yeah, you're not accomplishing anything here. And they would disagree because they they still get, you know, three bales of hay an acre and they think they're successful. Um, with the new the new owners, uh, you're going to you're also going to have both. You're going to have people who've been reading about it and studying it for years and they finally own their own ground. So so they will they'll they'll pursue it from day one. Um, I have uh, one couple who he's Mr. Pragmatic and she is very idealistic. And, and he basically says, that's fine. If you want to pursue soil health, um, I'll support you. But what he doesn't say is I have no interest in soil health. You know, he's, he's a money's guy and he's looking at the dollar trade-off short-term dollar trade-off on with every decision. So um, it really is where you find it. it and, um, and of course, the longer you, you get to work with these people, the more you can kind of sway them. You can, you can introduce ideas and over time, situations will come up where your suggestions can be revisited and say, that's what I was talking about. And they go, oh, okay, now I get it. You know, I can take, a t but we, we're on a, 12 month iterative cycle in this business. So everything happens one year at a time. Yeah, that, that's good. Hopefully if you need other clarification on that, Jessica, feel free to raise your hand. We can unmute yet. Um, and let's kind of shift towards the ranch manager side. And what I understand what you're trying to do, Dan, is to be able to fill that need between the ranch owners and building ranch managers that can step into that. And just out of curiosity, as anybody, I know on the summit, this question came up, you know, how do we get into ranch management? How do we, uh, how does a young person do that? Is anybody here on this um, recording today in that boat, like they would like to have the opportunity to be able to either be trained or mentored or move into a management position on a regenerative managed place. You got one. Yes. Yeah. Jessica, very good. Um, so can you speak to that a little bit? Like what, um, what your program looks like that builds ranch managers? Sure. And the first thing I would say um, for, you know, people who are keenly interested in this, uh, in, in regenerative practices at the same time as just trying to get established in the industry is always remember that you have your what and you have your how, okay? We, we don't always get to work on both at the same time. So we have to understand that, you know, what I get to do today is the what, right? I'm doing the basics. This is my entry. This is my permission to enter the industry. If I'm fortunate enough to arrive in the industry, then I'm, I have more time to work on the how. Okay, so 
you know, just being aware of that is key because if you try to do everything at once and you, all, everything all the time, uh, you'd be disappointed because life isn't that way. It's just not that neat. neat. You might have to go away for two years and get an education in just what the business of ranching is before you ever get a chance to work on, you know, uh, reestablishing a, a field or something that, that really turns your wheels, right? That, where you really feel like, okay, I'm working on the essence of this problem now. I'm on the ground. Well, I forget what the rancher's name was north of you, um, Jared, that did the um, podcast on the restoration of his bottomlands. Yeah, um, A.G. Smith. Yes, yes, yeah. See, yeah. so you look at you look at the quality of the work that those ladies were able to participate in on his ranch. They, they took a while for them to get that opportunity, years of study and doing things that you know probably weren't all that inspiring, and then they get a chance to do a, a project like that. Yeah, so. that's that's. That's good. I know um, when Bud Williams came and visited us somewhere around 2007, Bud and Eunice spent the day with us and we, we got on the subject and I'm going to try to, with Eunice's permission, um, send that audio out as a podcast, um, edit it and send it out because there were some real gems in there. But I asked Bud, I said, how do you create branch managers? And uh, he said, first of all, you uh, become a good ranch worker. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I think that's when looking kind of through your curriculum, there's, there's the education component, but there's the practical experience um, that goes right along parallel with that. Am I right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and that's where colleges, um, not so much community colleges, I'll talk about them at another time. But this is where universities uh, really let us down. Um, not that there's not good people. Uh, you know, Rachel Frost and I become good friends and we've been able to help each other a lot. But the fact of the matter is, those big um, four year institutions, they have to fill seats, period. And so those curriculums, they may be no more than a 40% solution for somebody who really needs an education because if you, they don't have a choice They're They have to fill their seats. They have to work their curriculums. Um, and it's, it's very uh, staff centric, not student centric. So having set taken the, you know, the freedom to say that um, there's so many other opportunities and, you know, we focus on the, the traditional apprenticeship. And I tell my young people all the time, I say, take charge of your apprenticeship. Quit looking for a job because a job is just a shot in the dark. And employment in the agriculture industry is very unsuccessful. The turnover is very high. Um, uh, drama and strife on the ranch is very high. And, and so, um, you don't have a lot of support in those employment situations. You're out, you know, uh, on a remote ranch with somebody that you uh, don't know yet. And so they're high risk situations. And so my view is that if you understand, um, and we have materials to help young people with this as well as the mentors as well. But if you understand what the, what your goal is, where to arrive in 10 years as a master, then it does a tremendous amount to bridge all of the, the um, unfortunate situations you're going to have to go through along the way. It gives you perspective and it keeps, it keeps you encouraged. It keeps you focused and employers, many of them will acknowledge this. Some of them are seeing it for the first time, but when somebody comes, a young person comes along, and they have a sense of who they are and where they're going, that employer has somebody they can work with. Because that person gets up and self-selects every day and they're a joy to work with. And, and, and employers would give anything to have, you know, as many of those people as they can. Well, it starts with the young person 
and being self-aware and having a plan, having an apprenticeship where you're conscious of what you, so in, in we, we self-select in, in our self-assessment tool, the instructions read, <clears throat> rate yourself on each item as a one, I need to get started on this. As a two, I can do this with some help or research. Or number three, I can do this and I can teach this. Now, if you have a list of 25 things, essential skills and, and, um, and abilities uh, to function as a ranch manager, you need to be able to rate yourself accordingly on each of those things and be correct about it, be honest about it. Because how you present yourself is everything. And I, uh, I was talking the other day with Rec Ray Markser, uh, retired from the Matador, Matador Ranches uh, at Beaver Creek. And um, he said, I, we were talking about this very thing. And he goes, when I started at Beaver Creek, the average turnover was two and a half years. Once we instituted written roles and responsibilities and expectations and work agreements, our average employment went to 11 years. Yeah, that's kind so of in, on a it is on it is unheard of. Scale. But it was that's just cool. a requisite uh, um, the minimum amount of structure in those relationships created an accountable environment where people could could get up every morning and feel like they were progressing and they were happy. Yeah, that is so that is so important. Um, and my mind's kind of reeling here of all the directions we can go. But so sticking sticking here with um, building the manager, uh, and in our terms, we call it the steward. But um, if a young person wants to, is, is an aspiring ranch manager, they want to go and they want to. Um, manage a place e even if it's their own place what would that look like with working with you dan like where would you say they start and do you have branches where they can um, go through this apprenticeship on currently yes yeah, so our registry is is still informal at this time um you know i don't have the the manpower right now to to formalize it the way, you know, it's one of the reasons why I brought up um, Jesse Jarvis as an example. She, she, she's got an excellent head for business and she's putting structure in place for the long term. So she's been a really a good inspiration for me. And I can see where the foundation can develop down the road. But I can give you an example of it. Just yesterday, I heard from a young person in, in Eastern Oregon who I've been working with for three years. And <clears throat> He has a range ecology degree and um, would tell you that if he was starting over, that's not what he would have done. But we just don't know ourselves when we're 18 years old. And so that's what he did. He got a range ecology degree and it didn't translate well to ranching because he still had a long list of skills that he did not have. So I started working with him. Um, he took a job. Uh, with a, uh, a range management uh, bureau of sorts um, and kind of like an extension position. And so he, he was working, he was gainfully employed, he was providing for his family, but the desire to be in ranch management became stronger all the time. And so he gained confidence every three or four months and we do an assessment. He was more interested and determined to arrive than he was than he was before and so that's the first thing i was able to help him with is keep his perspective and be aware then he started using the self-assessment tools he went to farrier, farrier school he went to ai school um, and he took advantage of any opportunity he was out doing rangeland uh, surveys and meeting ranchers and he would just ask Hey, can I come out this weekend and do it with you? So he never took his eye off the ball. And three years later, um, he uh, he called a ranch in, um, in Eastern Oregon, 
good friends of mine, owners from California who operate a ranch in um, Grant County and got the assistant manager position there. So that's how it happens. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot there. Um, that drive and that determination, I think is, is so key. Right. And um, I, it, it pains me to think on both sides to hear that young people can say, I can never get started in ranching. And then for ranch owners to say, I can never find a good manager. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's just, yeah, maybe it is more challenging. Um, I know this younger generation, maybe they lack some focus, maybe they lack some of the skills that they have, but they have other skills that complement that. And so those who have the sincere desire, um, I say the, you know, the field is wide open. And I still think, um, again, back to Bud Williams, one of my mentors, he said, there are so many opportunities in ranching because it is so mismanaged. Um, and so if we don't have to be perfect, we just have to have the desire and have to start and continue to learn just as you've, as you've spelled out here, Dan, and I appreciate that. Um, Another something on that um, vein is uh, a couple of years ago, I was talking with Mark Lacey. Um, Mark Lacey family is one of the foundational ranching families in central California. And <clears throat> Mark had just finished uh, a, a stint as manager or as president of uh, Ca California Cattlemen's Association. And he was moving from there and going to California Rangeland Associate, Ra Range Trust to take a board position. And he said, Dan, this is why I'm doing it. We started California Rangeland Trust and wasn't very long before our success caught up with us. Every time we put acres on our balance sheet, we create a liability. And nobody had ever thought it in that, of that in those terms, okay? So he was going over there to be a board member to work on this very problem. Um, when, when land goes into trust, it's monetized with no insurance assurance that that land's gonna stay in production. I believe the key is young managers because those acres could be leased and those leases could be managed by rangeland trusts for the purpose of keeping them in the in production because there is no shortage of um ngos out there who are going to purchase base ranches and allow the grazing rights to be sold off as well, along with the conservation easement on the base ranch. And, and there's a whole industry out there is just circling, waiting for those public lands uh, acreages to, to come available and they'll retire them. So what's gonna, what should stand in the gap of that? I believe just like what you said is we have to have owners and maybe those rangeland trusts that are operated by producers, such as California Rangeland Trust, Wyoming Stock Growers Rangeland Trust, Northwest Rangeland Trust, they have an opportunity to go to the owners and say, look, while we're putting this trust in place, let's agree that this ranch will always remain in production. And then let's put in some basic parameters that bring young people onto the land and allow them to ranch it. Yeah, that's, that's wide true. open. Nobody's doing doing that yet, and it's yeah. an opportunity that's staring us right in the face. Yeah, I like that. I think, man, that's worth having another conversation about, Dan. And so, as we kind of wrap up this official, the podcast side of it, well, I know there's some people with some questions, and maybe we can unmute and do a little more informal here in a minute. But um, how do people get a hold of you, Dan? What's the best way to to come in contact if they say, "Hey, I've." either um, I'm interested in the ranch management, ranch manager training side, or in um, using your consultant services, what? Sure. What's the way um, to reach you? One way is, is, is my email address. It's ranchresource at gmail.com. Okay. Easy enough. 
I'll put that in the chat, ranchresource at gmail.com. And so, yeah, I'd say definitely just reach out, tell them what your interest is. Um, and uh, yeah, from visiting with you both in person and via email and text, very responsive and extremely knowledgeable about ranch management. Um, so we, we definitely appreciate having you on here today. We uh, want to make people aware that if you haven't already, I know a few of you have signed up for the two-day class that we have in um, February. It's 15th and 16th. I'm just going to drop this in the chat. The best way to find it, if you're just catching the audio, is events.agsteward.co. Events.agsteward.co. Not com, just co. And that'll that'll put you um, in charge. We've got that still open, a few seats available. Um, what this is, is basically we are looking for individuals who want to scale their ag enterprise. And so when we work with people one-on-one, -on -one, we kind of have two different programs. We'll get you to 100K and we can take you and we can, that's the base level program. The second level is we will increase your gross income by 250K. 250,000. Um, and this is just an introduction. We're going to distill those two programs down into two days. Obviously, there's not going to be a lot of hand holding there in two days. There's going to be a lot of things that you will need to do to go and implement that. Um, but if you want to get to those levels of either starting a business and reaching that benchmark or scaling a business that you currently have, we can help with that. I have no doubt you'll get there on your own. Like Dan said, if you've got the determination and the drive and the desire, you can get there. But perhaps you can get there faster with some help. And so that's the whole the whole idea with this program. Um, and the price still is, uh, it's $47, which is super reasonable. Question whether we should sell it at that price because it seems like, well, how good can it be for that price? Um, but as we prayerfully considered and consulted as a family and as a team, we decided that's the price we're going to offer it at. Uh, this time, especially to those who have been on the summit and those who have supported the Ag Steward up to this point. So events.agsteward.co. Um, we hope to see many of you in that. You'll be getting an email with the bonus session that we had with Dave Pratt and then some other correspondence with a little bit of pre-work to be ready. So you can just, um, it is a plan on marking out the 15th and 16th. Um those two days as what be time, like time to really work on your business. And it's, uh, it's even though it's virtual, um, I can promise you it is going to be interactive. It's going to be engaging. It's not just going to be a boring, like, Oh, wow. What do I, why am I here? Um, if you're committed, you will get, uh, exponentially like 10 X results multiplier over what you invest, not only in the monetary investment, but in your time putting into that. So, Hope to see many of you on that. Um, we're going to open it up now. And um, I know Jessica had some questions. Jessica, are you able to unmute? Do you want to, rather than try to distill down about three or four different things that you asked? Oh, which one of us? There's actually two Jessicas on this call. If you're lucky. <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, we'll start with you since you're unmuted. Then we'll go to thank Jessica you. without a last name. Um, Dan, uh, and thank you, Jared, for, for hosting this so much. Um, Dan, what is the average annual salary for a beginning ranch management position? And then as a follow-up, what's the cap or maximum for an experienced career-long manager? Good question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you would have to give me a scenario. So if, in other words, if you're asking from the context of your geographical location and the, the type of operation you are interested in running, I could give you some more accurate numbers, but it literally there are, there are ranches where there's a lot of opportunity. They can't afford to pay more than $2,000 a month ever. So you either take that for it as an education or you keep looking. Um, then you also have, uh, if, if income is important to you, you might want to focus on an investor ranch where they have a lot of capital and they don't balance their books. So, 
you're going to be busy all the time, but you might be doing some hospitality work. You might be hunt, guiding hunting trips. You might be doing a lot of things to keep you busy and you could make $75,000 a year. Earlier, you, to, you, you mentioned one, one person per 500 head. So um, I was thinking maybe in that along the lines of that context. Okay. Um, again, it's going to be uh, depend on the operation, how busy they can keep you. If all they're running is cattle, Okay, those dollars can be expected to track right along with with the economics of their cattle herd. Um, it, with without a lot, uh, there's nothing else to supplement either their income or your income. But it, it if I was talking about Eastern Oregon and the scenario that you were talking about, which was highly disciplined, then that ranch should be able to pay that cattle steward 35 to 38 thousand dollars a year plus housing and i don't consider housing to be compensation but what i'm saying is as long as that 38 thousand dollars is not compromised by other costs to the individual you should still be able to save money thank you very much that really helps appreciate it Dan. and then you get in you get into other areas uh like feeding and backgrounding Okay, those operations are getting a, a larger portion of the of the profit dollar, and they have to they have to compete for employees. So you're bumped up to like fifty five thousand dollars right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so just thank you, Jessica. Great question. Appreciate that, Jessica. Number thank two. Thank you. Are you still there? Are you able to unmute? I know you had. Um, Something I did read through it. It sounded like you were kind of in an Arizona context. Yeah. Um, I guess just a ranch that's in mess. Um, and where do, you, where do you start? Um, where do you put your focus? Because it seems overwhelming and you don't know where to put your resources. And I don't know. It's a very broad question. Yeah. So just... To go back your 55,000 acres adverse grazing, which I just learned what that term is. That means that there are um, homesteaders in mingled in that grazing allotment. Is that what that means? Yeah. So in Arizona, they have like a checkerboard patent. So every other section is Arizona state or privately owned. And so we have people that own property on that ranch. And if, if they don't fence it, then we have the right to graze their property so sure. challenges so bottom line is like what with that with feral dogs with dealing with neighbors who may or may not be good neighbors where do you put your focus does that kind of boil down the question yeah i mean we've basically all we've got in in place is the boundary fences we do have a highway that runs through so it kind of splits the bottom third off of the ranch um but currently we have everything out all year round everywhere uh so you know grazing rotation is non-existent and not practical at this point what um, kind of loss, what's your loss rate i don't even know it's bad i mean uh, our calving uh calf crop is about 52 percent okay um yeah year-round calving or do you pull the bulls year-round calving year-round calving yeah i mean yeah and this have, are there feral cattle in there with them? No, no. All right. <clears throat> well, a, a lot of it has to do with the density, you know, just how many acres do you have to watch all the time? Um, but I, I believe that, that putting people with cattle pays dividends. Um, every situation's different, but you've got, Riders, um, some of you might be familiar with uh, Alder Creek in Idaho. Um, they put their cows out into steep canyon country in the summer with lots of wolves. And so they put three riders with their cattle and they're moving them every day. So it pays for them to do that. Um, another ranch uh, in Wyoming, they didn't ride one pasture, which is about 40,000 acres. They didn't ride that pasture all summer. They lost 60 calves. So, you know, I don't know if, if that translates at all, Jessica, to your situation, 
But if you can identify very real advantages by um, by putting people out there and you can monetize them and get the return back from their effort, yeah, it's risky, but that's business. And if that's what your situation requires, then you might look at that. Yeah. yeah. Does that help, Jessica? Yeah, it's all just the practicality of doing it, you know, when you're kind of barely making the payment on a, yeah, it's hard to think in those terms. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to appreciate appreciate that when capital's tight and you're asked to expend capital. Um, and so that might be where an outside perspective could help to see, okay, where where would that um, capital be best spent so that it's it returns you a multiplier and isn't just the, an expense? Yeah, the other thing I would um, think about, Jessica, is <clears throat> um, focus on what other people are doing and succeeding with in your area. You know, so join your county cattlemen's association or whatever association you have to get to know those people and be relentless answer because doing it and succeeding with it yeah um were you able to watch the summit last week jessica no sorry okay um do you have you should have it on uh an email right um maybe i don't my father-in-law forwarded me an email so i don't know if i got in after that or... okay i'll see know. if i can I'll see if I can send the link here. Um, there's some pretty key things. And I get like when you're struggling to breathe, it's hard, it's hard to think about anything but air, but oxygen. Right. Um, yeah. And so in that scenario, uh, yeah, take care of the immediate needs first, cover home base and then let's look out. But I'll see if I can, I'll find this real quick and put it in the chat, but Anybody else who if, just feel free to unmute. This is a little bit um, unregulated at this point. So if you would like to ask Dan a question, you can unmute and we and you can have the floor and ask away. Hi, Dan. Hi. Hi, my name is Olia, and I am currently <laughs> not the typical person you find on here, but I am an HOA landowner. <laughs> <laughs> with a desire to do something regenerative with some land somewhere at some point. I have no experience. I have ancestors with experience, but I do not have any experience. And I'm trying to figure out how to start my education. Um, well, I guess I'm starting here and I've found certain things in the wrong places. I guess I need to put, get my hands dirty and start learning about um, cattle and how things work here in Arizona my uh i hear you're coming to phoenix soon and um i was wondering what you were coming for where in the phoenix valley you were going to be um i know there's a huge um uh rodeo place near where i live and i was wondering if maybe that might be where you were coming to or um where exactly you're going to be and then maybe what i could learn from you about finding cattle for the desert. It sounded like there was someone else on here who wanted that too. Um, and um, like, who do I talk to? Where do I go? It sounded like you said there was a cattlemen's club we should join. Well, it'd be the cattlemen's association. Association. Thank you. Yep. So just, just go ahead and do a, a web search for <clears throat> Arizona cattlemen's association. And um you, you can join as an associate and you'll, you'll, you'll learn a ton just by getting to know those people. Um, and the other thing I would do is uh, look at the community colleges. Community college programs are excellent. They're affordable. They have excellent instructors at that level for the most part. Um, and they tend to be community-based. What that means is a target rich environment for the student because they can make, you know, very immediate introductions uh, to get started with work. Uh, to get started. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, I know, Aliyah, you were 
uh, usually get the award for being the most dedicated to watching the summit. I think last week, um, shuttling kids around and homeschooling and everything else. So we appreciate that. And, uh, certainly continue to educate yourself. But, um, the other thing, if you can find ranchers around there and just, uh, use, use that as an opportunity, just say, Hey, can we bring our kids out as an educational opportunity and kind of learn the context, learn the lingo, learn, um, you know, the, you might have to ask two or three of them. Not everybody's open to it, but uh, we certainly do that. I mean, William does that all the time, um, has people who come and get their hands dirty. They get experience. Um, and even if you have to pay a little bit for it, uh, that is so valuable. Yeah, I might be able to use some ESA funds if there's a farm near me that has the ability to... Um teach children a class and then I could get an in that way. But right now expendable finances are not a thing that exists in this home. So, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, yeah. Th those are good ideas. I'll see what I can do to get my hands um, involved on a ranch somewhere. I've had a bad experience where I was trying to support a farmer and in my ignorance, I did some things that, I mean, they weren't like horrible sins or anything, but they were, they made the farm manager uncomfortable because my kids were walking around and looking at animals or okay, just little things like that, that I did wrong and made him uncomfortable and he didn't want to do business with me anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah um, I, and that, so I'm, I'm, like, I'm trying to figure out like, how do I want to present to these people? What are, what are some etiquette rules that I am unaware of and things like that <laughs> at that <laughs> basic level. So yeah, that those are those are great questions. We appreciate that you're part of this community because you know those those of us that are raised around it, we just kind of take for granted that everybody knows. But um, but certainly just going and observing, asking questions, the dumb questions, and finding somebody you know that's willing to kind of show you around. Um, so we've got uh, let's see, we've got Liz and Sean in just a minute. Let me ask this question first. What what percentage of ranchers make their living um, off only ranches and do not have outside jobs? And uh, this is pretty common. Appreciate your candidness here, Pat. We cannot make enough to support a family on ranching only, and you're certainly not alone in that. So what do you think on that one, Dan? Um, <clears throat> I, I made the comment to Will. Well, I think William got me talk, thinking about this seriously a year ago, but um we wouldn't be anywhere without the average rancher can you turn on one light over there please um and and the average herd in the united states is somewhere between 38 and 40 head so we the majority of cattle ranchers are getting uh, a good portion of their income from town they just are that's just a reality of it um, so to say that you're not a real rancher, if you have a job at the credit union or, you know, at the feed store or whatever, and you have to have that income in order to keep ranching, uh, it's just not a valid point. It, it, it's just a reality of our, of our market. However, <clears throat> you know, and there, there'll be, there'll be people, you know, who will say that you're a hobby rancher because of that. But I think that's missing the point. I think what we should focus on is, and you, your ranch is a good example of this, Jared, um, what we've lost, and, and I tell my, my clients this when they say, how does anybody make a living at this? You know, Because they have all the capital in the world, but they don't like to lose money. And I say, okay. And, I, and we had a chance to walk around a century ranch two summers ago with the new owners and i pointed out there is there's a log chicken house there and it was about 300 square feet it was a good sized chicken house with a yard and, and everything and i said they they raised chickens they had three dozen eggs a day and they sold eggs and then we went to the barn and half of the barn was a milking barn with milking stations in it I said, they milked cows every day and they sold milk. 
And I just went from building to building to building. They had a blacksmith shop with a foundry in it. And they, they said, I said, these people did heavy steel work and they did it for their neighbors and they got paid. And so, you know, it, the light slowly came on that our ranches are not self-sufficient anymore. There's way too much d- dependency on Costco and Walmart. And we have to have cash dollars in order to shop in town. Okay. Now, are we going to go back to the agrarian life of the 1800s? No. But still keeping that awareness is very important because if you really want to, to not just survive, but thrive, you're going to have to start bringing back some of those foundational elements to the ranch so you can be more self-sufficient. And it's not just romance. It's, it's just life. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great question. And uh, I didn't, you know what percentage I would say probably more rely on outside sources of income than not. I, I think it's safe to say, but, um, and one of the things that we talked about a little bit in the summit and we teach is, you know, um, we, we, yes, we need to treat our businesses as businesses. Um, but the truth of it is most of our businesses are subsidized in either unpaid, underpaid wages um, eating into equity or government subsidies of some kind. Um, and, uh, and so there's maybe nothing morally wrong with that, with doing that, but just, just know the cost there. Right. And if you are going to participate in that, how sustainable is that really? So Liz, yeah, did you, oh, I think ahead. more often than not, it's not sustainable because people just burn out. You know, yeah. that's unfortunate that's about it. It's just, and, and they take it, they, they get emotionally attached to their animals and they get emotionally attached to their identity as a rancher or as a farmer. Um, and then when that's threatened, they don't have the mental health skills to overcome it. And that's the unfortunate part, I think, because, you know, it just is. And, and yet there, I wish I could remember the name of the place in, in central Texas. I think it's right out of Austin young couple they have a beef business and they insisted upon thriving they insisted upon thriving so they went about building a ranching business that allowed them to do that so they lease their grass they know exactly what they can pay and what they can't pay for the grass um you know and they built up their herd and they've gone vertical with their their marketing and so they're capturing nearly every you know cent of that profit dollar uh from that from that box beef and i think it you know, it takes that level of intentionalness to 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 pull it off it really does yeah i like that if you didn't inherit the land you know if you didn't inherit the land you're in a completely different scenario yeah liz did you have a question you want to unmute and you can ask dan yeah um so we're in the process of hiring another person on the ranch um, again. And since Sean and I took over in 2020 and we've had two employees in that time. So to basically just right around two years, we've had both employees and uh, we're kind of struggling for incentives. Like, I mean, we've got the whole, you know, KRA, we tell them, you know, what they're going to do, you know, what our dreams are and we're trying to pair it up with their dreams and, like we feel like we have a really pretty robust hiring process, but the last two have been like, no, I wouldn't say they're a flop. Like the last guy that left actually kind of surprised us. We thought everything was going good. And then he just upped and left for a different opportunity. And so we've been trying to dig around, like, do we need to incentivize them by allowing them to have cattle? Like, you know, incentivize them by basically having some skin in the game. But it sounds like you've been around to larger, larger ranches and things like, is it unrealistic for us to think that we can have someone for more than two years at a time? Or do you think it's just kind of more of the nature of the game when you're on a smaller outfit that doesn't have like the advancement ladder, like a big ranch does? So, yeah, what I would say is that it is 100% scalable. You know, uh, people will argue uh, in a business, you can be profitable with a hundred dollars of income. You can be profitable as long as your expenses are commensurate with your income. So to say that just because we only have one or two employees, we can't compete or we're missing some other major component 
that's going to account for success in those relationships is not true. It mm-hmm. is not true. It's how you view yourself as the employer and how you can also put yourself in your employee's shoes. So put it this way. If you're looking for the best, they're looking for the best. So how do you organize yourself and present yourself to attract that individual who is a self-starter, who is, you know, self-selecting, who has maybe higher standards than you do, always a joy to work with and never a burden. Okay. Those people are out there, you know, but how we present the opportunity to the, to them makes all the difference in the world because all they're doing is going through jobs and, and oftentimes they feel they have to go through numerous jobs to get lucky. Yeah. So let's not rely on luck. Let's be deliberate. And I, and we have forms, you know, um, strategies that you can use to do that, but it takes work to present yourself in that fashion. Yeah, I mean, we just we just did our job up for we just put out our job application. We've we've had over 100 people apply mm-hmm. for it. So thankfully, the base is there. But then when you actually start going through the process, you find out most of the people are we're just kind of clickbaity and not really that interested. Right. So um, let me tell you, let me tell you a real quick story. And then I want to hear the end of your question. OK, yeah, go ahead. And it goes to your point. So um, Agribeef in, in their beef feeding business last year. They started an apprenticeship program because they could not find or keep management candidates in their business, right? So this is what they did. They offered a five-year apprenticeship and we're going to pay full salaries to these people to learn for five years. It was going to cost them five to $600,000 per employee just to get them qualified to be a manager with no assurance that they're going to contribute anything in the, in the interim. What does that tell you about the need? It's pretty big. <laughs> yeah. They, they had like 35 interviews. They offered positions to three people, two of those people ghosted them. And so out of that entire effort, they got one apprentice candidate. Wow. Wow. Where's yeah. Jeff? Yeah. You know, the gym <laughs> So the first is don't give up and try to get better at about telling your story um, and then make sure that the little things are top notch. Okay. Housing that would make you thrilled. Okay? Well, actually we're in the process of that. We're building a new house for his parents so that okay. the employees can move into his parents' house because our, our housing situation right now is not good. So sure. especially if there's a spouse involved, if there's a spouse okay. involved and the ho- housing is subpar, you know, yeah. Just, yeah. well, yeah, she's just, just say that's not going to work. So, you know, make sure all the little things are perfect as they can be. Uh, and then you've ruled those things out and you can focus on the bigger issues. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've been surprised we're, we're promoting ourselves as a family friendly ranch. And so we've had several candidates that are at bigger ranches that are not family friendly, that are looking for this type of scenario. So, I mean, we know we have some advantages. I just wasn't sure about as far as the commitment part, is there any other ways, any other like collective ways that can be marketed or at least, I don't know, some sort of advantage for them to stick around longer than two years. Cause that's just about the time that they finally know the place and then they leave. Right. Right. Um, You know, I think the lifestyle matchup is, you know, um, there is some luck involved in that. And, you know, and sometimes it just takes going through a lot of people to get a good match there. But the things you do have control over, um, you know, uh, Stacy Davies told me a long time ago, he said, I used to get really upset about the high turnover rate they had at Roaring Springs. And he said, one day I realized I don't have any control over these young people. I can't control who they are when they come to us. But he says, what I can control is I can control my attitude towards them. So he went from being, you know, upset about the high turnover rate to saying, I'm going to invest. I'm going to teach them and show them as much as I possibly can. I'm going to convince them how important they are to this operation while they're here. So when they go away, they can say, they always say, I was glad I was there. Okay. I, I always enjoyed my time there. And he said, when I made that, that shift, okay. 
those individuals are getting something qualitatively different from me than they'd ever gotten before. And they did stay longer. And they did speak highly of him when they left. So, yeah. Great question, Liz. I appreciate you bringing that up. That's kind of needs to be an ongoing conversation that we have um, amongst family businesses. How do we, how do we position ourselves so that we attract the people who are out there that are looking for the opportunities that we have. And um, so, well, guys, I think we better wrap it up for tonight. We've been going for an hour and a half. We appreciate your time, Dan. Um, what do you guys think? Is it worth to stay on a little bit after kind of have this more informal rather than just cut it off? Is that you guys give me a thumbs up, thumbs down? Yes. No. Art's giving me a thumbs up. So uh yeah let me know in the chat it's just um just so we can know as we ask our future presenters um to stay on a little bit longer so definitely good okay i'm getting enough feedback that i'm saying seeing that this is good so so we'll continue this format we'll kind of do the one hour where it's more regimented um people are on mute that will go out as the podcast. The next half hour will probably um, be the unedited YouTube that will go out. So I know some of you had asked before if we could if we could keep the recording on. And so we'll do that. So the podcast will be the first hour and then we'll have the, the last half hour be a little more informal. But um, Dan, I always like to give our presenters a, the final word and what any anything else that you would like to share before we jump off here. Well, I, I was just thinking again about the, the um, small, the really small operation and the challenges they have. And if you, if you want to offer something, a path for your employees to keep them more uh, engaged uh, and feel like that they're really progressing with you, um, the apprenticeship program is scalable. You can have a top-notch program with just one apprentice. That's the beauty of it. Um, other than that, I, I would say, uh, you know, because you know, I want to honor your theme here of, of you know, um, regeneration. The there, like I said before, there's the what that we do and the how that we do it, and you know, ran, ranching and farming is getting um, is under attack these days. Um, and my encouragement to people is don't be an easy target, okay? Um, if, if you have an opportunity to demonstrate that the how you're doing things is really, really good and that you care, that's, a, that's an unassailable position. But if we're lazy, okay, as, as an industry, um, then we deserve the criticism that we get. Um, we, we were on a, on a big uh, outfit in... Um, in Northern Nevada, not too long ago and <clears throat> writing the checkerboard area to your point earlier. And we were, we were on a section of BLM land where there was a water pump. There was a well with a, a pump and it was a mess. Okay. Those cowboys, you know, they had multiple generators out there. They're all shot. They just leave them out there they had oil, they're changing the oil, leaving the oil on the ground. And it was just a mess for the public to see. Yeah. So that's my challenge to, to people in our own industry. You know, take pride uh, in everything we do and make yourself beyond reproach. You know, that's the best basis I think we can build from. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dan. And thanks, everybody, for attending. We're going to... Um, we're going to have another guest here and you guys are on the email list. So you'll find out who that is. We've kind of booked out here through the first quarter. Got some great people that are going to be on and um, this caliber of people talking about the regenerative movement, ranching, and even um, some like we did on the summit. Sometimes we'll occasionally have somebody from outside the industry just to expand our perspective. So we hope to see you all next time and um, look for those of you who, um, attended the summit i'm going to shoot out a text right now with a special offer from our partners at farm rebel um so if you get that that's what that's about uh that 
didn't get posted to the um, bonus page yet. So I wanted to make sure that people are aware of that because people have been asking. Um, we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Dan, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.